to all of those of you who have been following us along this long week. This will be the 30 minutes on technology. Unfortunately, these remote, these virtual meetings are shorter than the face-to-face -face meetings. The first presentation will be by Guillermo Pereira, who will tell us about a project we have in Pereira with open Pereira with open DNS resolvers. Then someone who is so known to all the community, Guillermo Tisile, who will speak about the other leg of the Ford project. You're aware of the Ford project and RPKI validator. He will be speaking about the Ford monitoring. And finally, I will be closing with a presentation. And more than a presentation, this is like a call to the community on LACNIX IRR. So without further ado, I'll give the floor to Nico. Sorry to Guillermo. 10 minutes for each presentation. <coughs> Thank you, Carlos. I'm going to speak about a project that we're carrying out, which is a detection of open DNS resolvers with IPv4 for the region. The objectives of the project is to identify the OR IPv4 for, to know the state, current status in the region to alert and recommend best practices to the community and to evaluate the effectiveness of the communications channels in order to warn the members. Now, why did we decide to do this? We decided to do this because these open DNS servers can be used to do denial of service. I have the experience of an ISP, and there are many, many attacks of denial of service that, in addition, they also do NTP attacks or other types of attacks or botnets. And these botnets use open resolvers, for example, to widen the bandwidth, for example, or to add further IP to the attack. But these are things that we note. And when there are attacks, we see these open resolvers in the middle. One, one of the attacks, for instance, um, an attacker may query a uh, DNS uh, resolver and may amplify what was uh, uh, set in in the query and if we add the thousands of resolvers that are open in latin america this affects the victim quite a lot because it's a lot of traffic now if we add instead of one single bot we add all the botnet of uh, karut or mirai querying these thousands of resolvers it's a lot a lot of traffic Here I brought this attack. It's a new attack that was published uh, this year in August. It's a it's the NXNS attack. An attacker acquires an authoritative uh, server. It's quite uh, cheap to get one, and the attacker uses a recursive resolver, conducts a query of its uh, authoritative server and the uh, resolver, the open resolver is going to do the request uh, to, the, uh, to the server and the server instead uh, will delegate to the victim. Hundreds of thousands of delegations with a victim server. And when the open resolver gets there, the way the protocol is built, will send all these queries to the victim server. And this gives rise to a lot of traffic that needs to be processed. The researchers here, a, uh, this is the link of the researchers. They managed to conduct uh, uh, amplification attacks more than 1,600 times the original. Uh, and if we add many bots with these 
uh, as each asking the queries. Uh, imagine multiply this by 1600. It's huge. This attack has more variants. I don't have the time now to show them, but well, you should see it. The researchers warned several institutions that have resolvers like Google, for instance, and servers such as Bind. You need to, well, but they corrected it. So if not, it has to be updated. For instance, let me show you a bit of the, the overall statistics. The This is an organization the shadow server is an organization that investigates vulnerabilities in the internet. One of them is the open uh, resolvers. If we see the statistics of shadow server, there are about 2 million, a bit more than uh, uh, 2 million servers in the world. The statistics for Latin America are quite close to our own figures. The average is 100,000 uh, IPs weekly that are opened. So the progress of our project. What we've done is we identified open resolvers for IPv4 in Latin America, and uh, then we warned the the servers affected and we recommended the best practices to solve it and we uh, uh, here i leave the link of ccert lacnic so that you can contact them and these are and now i'm going to give you the preliminary findings this is the first identification without Mexico, without counting Mexico and Brazil, we found 36,000. And if we add them, it's uh, like 50,000 to 60,000 IPs opened. After a after warning the uh, victims, we reduced the open resolvers by 40%. So before we finish the project, I'd like to, we'd like to to see what the final figure is. And to communicate the community, we have the um, contact, uh, the direct contact. We looked, we wanted to have a contact, a direct contact with the victims. We communicated with them and uh, we uh, informed them what was going on. and. Uh, to the we sent emails to the three or four countries that are worst affected and we managed a 43 percent reduction of uh, the ips affected and the rest was sent through milaknik also achieving uh, a reduction of uh, 36 percent some remarks only three percent of the victims that we warned answered and uh, of uh, the mails of the mails user only there was only a 10 percent rebound so uh, and we we hadn't contemplated all the solutions then I, later on i'm going to tell you which we hadn't and through our D, D, DAP, LACNIC, that we had 10% rebounds because either the mails don't exist or they have a full inbox. And one of the things that we found is that there are hundreds of vulnerable CPEs. Many devices that are given to the clients and that are vulnerable. Some ISPs closed the, shut the of general firewall for queries that came from outside of the internet. And another ISP sent a massive uh, query to all in the CPEs here. This is 
a project of uh, May last year where we discuss the best practice and we speak of the open resolvers of the CPEs. So we, you need to, to check that they are not uh, manufactured with an open board and they don't come like that by the vendor. So, and the final stage, it's a final assessment. We are going to iterate the, the, the screening and the detection and communication. We're going to get in touch with the uh, people affected again and we'll develop a final report and we'll share it with the community in November. Thank you. That was excellent, Guille. You were very clear with time. As a matter of fact, you even have one minute left for questions. And if not, I wanted to say, I wanted to clarify the terms because maybe not ev all, everybody knows. An open uh, resolver is a DNS that conducts a recursion without filtering the DNSs of origin. So that's one of the worst practices. It's something that you should avoid. So we don't have questions so far, and now we'll invite the other Guillermo Cicillio. Thank you, Carlos. Let me share my screen. The idea here is to present briefly the fault monitoring. As Carlos pointed out, it's a part of the Ford project. We haven't mentioned it much. We've seen that the Ford project had the validator. We talked about the report, uh, security, and the, we completed the work. We completed a, a tool to document the status of implementation of RPKI and the routing incidents in the region. The fault monitoring is essentially based on analyzing the global BGPE tables taken from the root route views and RIPE RIS. But we didn't take the dumps, but the uh, outdates, uh, the updates in real time. And we compare those the BGPE data from uh, RPKI information using uh, Optimator, uh, Routinator, and Ford. And we got information from the IRRs, wrapped and uh, RIPE and data of a, a registry data of LACNIC and the NRO. So by crossing the information, we may have coverage of RIAs of the BGP updates, the validity of the updates, that is from the BGP uh, announcements that are circulating in uh, the BGP global tables, what is the coverage by, well, how much is covered with ROA is the validity of the updates of BGP, classification per country, and detecting anomalies in the routing information. We don't have much time, but I'm going to briefly show you the slides. And although there are a lot of slides, I wanted to leave the uh, set as just in case you want to watch it later. So as to the deployment of RPKI, all of the information, both for IPv4 is, and IPv6, is separate. For instance, we can see the deployment of RPKI for IPv4 and IPv6 prefixes in the region. This is the ROA's uh, coverage based on the BGP tables. For, for instance, here you see the evolution of IPv4. This is Brazil, where you clearly see when they started deploying RPKI last year, the same thing happens with IPv6. As to validation, we also have this type of information and much of the information can be seen on maps that enable you to graphically compare the deployment and in this case, the number of valid prefixes in IPv4 or IPv6 comparing the different countries. So you see, for instance, that the darker countries are the ones that have a higher percentage of valid prefixes. 
And then we have information on potential route hijacks. And here I'm going to stop for a minute uh, because this is something that is nowhere else. And it is in the fourth project through monitoring, we consider not just information of RPKIs, but also the uh, uh, RRs so we can have the IRR so we can have we can see the updates to see whether they are valid according to RPKI, or if they are RPKI invalid, we can identify those that from the point of view of the IRR registries are correct. That is, they are announcements that correspond to a correct uh, registry in an IRR or the ones that are not correct concerning um, uh, vis a vis IRR, and then those that are not counted in any of the groups. So we have a range of uh, classifications, valid RPKI, invalid, and then the not found, which can be analyzed through from the point of view of an IRR, valid, valid or invalid, etc. So this can be seen in more detail later on here, for instance, you have a slide that speaks of potential route hijacking and it divides between the victims and uh, the offenders. You, you, uh, whenever there is a hijack, there's a victim and an offender by the guilty offenders. Well, we see that there are many in many parts of the world. There are details explaining why we consider that something is likely to be a route hijack and the cause. Sometimes they are ROA validations that do not match uh, the uh, announcement. Maybe it's poorly matched, but ultimately it is violating what you're saying about the BGP publication. That is, you are saying that something needs to meet the standards and what this detects is precisely that a flaw in uh, in the system or, or, or an error, but anyway, it's incorrect. Another novel thing that we introduced is an analysis of the critical infrastructure, where what we take as critical infrastructure is the CCTLDs, that is, the domains in each country. And there, from there, we analyze the uh, service and we see which may have problems from the point of view that we just saw. So for each announcement, we know the day it was seen on, which is a prefix, the origin autonomous system and the detected problem. It, as additional information, we can produce a monthly report. You can register entering your email address. And at the beginning of every month, you receive a report containing all this information. And finally, the technical reports. And you can see this by prefix or by autonomous system. You can specify a specific prefix or an autonomous system, and you obtain information on that. So I will finish with this. We invite you particularly to visit the site to report errors, suggestions for improvements, new functionalities, and also to use this information for decision making. One of the features of this site, of this project, is that we wanted this to include both the technical aspect, which we show here, as well as other aspects that can be checked by people who are not experts, for example, decision makers or other stakeholders that can contribute with the deployment of RPKI or improving routing. And these needn't be the technical experts from the organization. So that would be all. Here you have the links. And I don't know if we have time for questions. So we have a, a couple of minutes for questions, but I will take on from now and maybe we can leave questions for later on. Maybe you can pay attention to see if we have any questions. So I will 
take on from here and I would refer to something regarding using the information for decision making on several occasions throughout the week we spoke about things such as for example to create the ROH you have to know what the writing policy is or to know a, a given thing you have to have this or that information so there are public sources of information available as for example the port monitoring or the Infore, this project which was introduced these days, as well as NACNIC's initiatives and other RIRs that can provide information which can be useful for operational informed decision making. Now, the final talk of the afternoon has to do with IRR. Now, at least twice throughout the week, we spoke about LACNIC's IRR. So I will make a brief review about the IRRs. You are aware that IRRs are based on an RPSL language, the Routing Policy Specification Language. This can be used to express routing policy. What is routing policy? Well, a routing policy is to know from what autonomous system a route is originated, there are things that are far more complicated as who does peering, which prefix except an AS, and which allow going through to another AS. And why is this done? Well, if you can inform this in your routing policy to all the other autonomous systems that are there in the internet, these can set up their filters in their routers in order to accept what they have to accept, and that is it. Now, this language has a syntax that is a bit cumbersome, it's a bit old-fashioned, it was defined in RFCs that have quite a low number. We now have RFC 8000 or something, but these had times of glories back in the 2000s, and then they stopped being used, and now there is like a revival. And this is because we have learned a lot based on the RPKI experience, how we can do things better. So I are, what is an IRR? Okay, you can do queries such as this. There are objects, for example, autonomous systems, numbers, out num, which represent an autonomous system. So this is the information related to an autonomous system you also the information related to a route so you see how one thing is related to another they ask an rir for this prefix they tell you it's contained in this route which is here originated by this autonomous system and then you can consult the autonomous system you know which it is who maintains it and so on there are tools that allow you to configure filters automatically based on these IRs. Now, LACNIC's IRR, because this was created in the second era of the IRRs, is one that was born in a different way. We didn't do a full RPSL implementation because that would be too complicated. And to tell the truth, the experience of learning to use the language better shows us that quite a limited set of objects, which are the six we have here, and quite a limited set of uh, uh, elements, we can achieve 70-80% the advantages of IRR. This doesn't mean that this will need to evolve in the future, but to start with, we wanted to see that results most of the cases. So the RPSL objects that we have in NACNIC's IRR, the six we have here, route, route six, autonom, person, AS set, and maintainer. The interesting thing is that we already have a lot of information because we have the database containing those who maintain and manage the context. So, so we can summarize this, summarize this for you without requiring your creating these. So autonom can be synthesized. Route and route six can be synthesized based on the RPKI information. For us, a route object and an ROA are basically the same. And in the fact that this would have been a very bad design decision to have two real sources so that people load something as a route object and something else in RPKI. Because what would happen if we had two sources, then they end up saying two different things. 
So the only object that we cannot synthesize for you, but it's not that one, one that you're going to use all, but those who will do so will appreciate a lot, is the AS set object. AS set object is an object that depends on who the clients are, who are your downstreams, and if you have to create an AS set, this, this is something that you know as operators, and we cannot do this for you. I want to show you this graph, which counts the objects created in the IRR of the past 30 days. You see how this grew. You start to note that there is a clear development. Look at the two enormous steps here of organizations that created a lot of objects. That majority of these objects are route objects, but there are also some AS sets that start to appear. I don't have it here, but the LACNIC of IRR started with 2,000 something objects, and over the course of 60 days, this increased more than 100%. We're still far from having all as members using this. Now, what are the next steps? Mirroring. We are working and mirroring. Mirroring is important because potentially you can have many IRRs and those carriers who consume these don't know all the potential sources, so they just consume a central mirror, RADDB or NTT. So we're working so that the objects with source like NIC, which are the ones generating RADs, can be rebuilt by RADB and by NTT. We're quite close to that, and maybe next month or a month and a half we'll be able to do so. Now, this is not enough, and there's something that we need from you. We need to have a greater dissemination among the operators of the region so that you consume directly our RPSL. So speak with your carriers so they learn acceptance source like NIC. And this will be very useful for all of us. And there's something that I highlighted in yellow because we need to listen to you here. We need, do we need to support new objects and attributes? I estimate that yes, but we don't really know which. That's a point because, you know, the remnant use uh, usage is one of the things we don't know. So we need to know more about your daily operations. In fact, I already received some comments, particularly from the LACNOC people, from Arman, and uh, about some attributes that would be important to include. But I think this is a question that we should ask to the entire universe of operators from the region. So we need to listen from you. Are you interested in mirroring with an RTM directly from us? Is there anything else that we can do so that this information can be of use to you as operators? And then the issue of the additional objects and attributes is of a fundamental importance, which do you consider not only which, but also which are the use cases that you need to solve. And please don't be afraid of writing to me directly, or you can also write to technologia at lacnic.net. And please speak with your carriers so they accept source lacnic, because eventually they will be uh, consuming this through the mirroring or the other objects. So that would be my message. That is my appeal to you, the IRR and RPKI, because they go hand in hand for us. They are practically the same thing. So let us start using this, because this will allow us to improve, improve things throughout the region. I see we have a question. And I'm going to answer it because I, it's addressed to me. The use of LACNIC. The use of LACNIC. IRR, does this cost something? Well, that's a great question. LACNIX IRR, as all the other services such as RPKI or reverse DNS, do not have a cost associated to that, uh, not a cost as in addition to the membership. In the case of Mexico, we are now organizing things with NIC Mexico to see how Mexico uh, users can have access to our IRR, this is something we'll solve in the coming months.